The aim of this video is to explain to you why carbon dioxide emissions are what economists call inefficient. This is actually a broader point. Most pollution is inefficient uh, unless further steps are taken. But for our purposes, let's focus on the case of carbon dioxide. Now, first, to understand this, we need to recall some definitions. By efficient, we learn that there's an informal definition, that is, it's the absence of waste. The more precise definition we'd like to use, though, is an arrangement is efficient if there are no possible Pareto improvements. And conversely, an arrangement is inefficient if there is a possible Pareto improvement. What you might ask is a Pareto improvement? Well, it's simply this idea that you achieve a Pareto improvement if you make one person or more better off while at the same time making nobody worse off. So there's a sense in which a Pareto improvement is an unqualified good. It's good for at least one person and it's bad for nobody. So when we say that the emission of carbon dioxide is inefficient, we're simply saying that practice could be changed, making at least one person better off without making anyone worse off. So let's uh, try to anal analyze this situation in a bit more detail to show how that could be. Here's a simplified way of modeling what's going on with respect to carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions. There are two parties. There is an emitter, someone like you, and then there's a second party, which is really a group. Those are the victims, we'll say, the people who suffer the effects of carbon dioxide emission. And putting it very simply, there are just two salient causes of action here. The emitter can emit carbon dioxide or can fail to emit carbon dioxide. Now, if we analyze it in those terms, here's how it looks. I'm going to try and assign scores here for how good each action is for each party. So I've put a plus next to the emitter. That for emits carbon dioxide. That's because certain benefits accrue to people like us by our emitting carbon dioxide. We get to use electricity, turn on our air conditioners, drive our cars, and so on. On the other hand, if we don't emit carbon dioxide, we lose those benefits, and that's a hardship. So I'm putting a minus there to indicate it would be worse off. How would the victims fare? Well, the victims suffer, obviously, if we emit carbon dioxide. We now know all sorts of bad things will happen in future. That will be worse for the victims if we emit carbon dioxide. Whereas on the other hand, if we do not emit carbon dioxide, the victims would be relatively better off. Now, if you analyze it in those terms, it looks like there is no Pareto improvement possible here. Because if you go from the emitter emits to the emitter does not emit, one person is made worse off. On the other hand, if you go from uh, not emitting carbon dioxide to emitting carbon dioxide, which is the current status quo, in fact, well, another party's made worse off, the victims are made worse off. So no matter which of these two outcomes you choose to go to, it seems that at least one party has to be made worse off, and that contradicts the idea of a Pareto improvement. It turns out, however, that this is actually an unhelpful way of thinking about the available options. And this is actually an important contribution that economists have made. No doubt others have thought of it too, but an important contribution economists have made to how we think about the space of possibilities in policy problems like this. So when I talk about emitting CO2 versus does not emit CO2, I'm just conflating a whole range of possibilities because I could include among that emitting, say, a thousand tons of my life, or 999 or 950, or 800, or 500, or 5, and of course all the options in between. Really what we need to think about when we're trying to find a possible Pareto improvement is among all of those various options, and there are infinitely many of them, are any of those going to be an improvement for some people without worsening the situation of others? Now, how do you grasp, though, an infinitely wide range of options and analyze it in a simple table? Well, there are a variety of mathematical tools we could use, 
But because I want to keep this presentation as simple as possible, there's actually a little trick we can do whereby we reduce it to a two option matter at the sort of, uh, sort of affair that still can fit in a table, but we have to change the nature of the options we put in the table somewhat. This is associated with an idea known in economics as marginalism. It's the idea that you should focus on the margins of our behavior. Is it possible to make a small change from what we're currently doing? So the way you apply it in this circumstance is you say, what about emitting the last ton of carbon dioxide? Could we give that up and achieve a Pareto improvement? So our options are not simply emits and does not emit. It's rather emits everything we're currently emitting or emits nearly as much, fails to emit just that very last ton of carbon dioxide. That's what the second option becomes. Okay, now that we have a more satisfactory breakdown of the available options, what we're going to need to do in order to identify possible Pareto improvements is assign some sort of value to each option for each party. And we need to be a bit more precise than last time. The figures I'm going to give you might uh, uh, going to seem arbitrary and made up. There is actually a reason for them, but I'm not going to be able to address them in this particular video. I'm going to suggest the benefit to you of emitting the last ton of carbon dioxide you emit is worth $10 to you. And in comparison, therefore, not emitting that last ton is worth $0. Now, we don't need to put a lot of weight on the absolute figures. It's just the relative consideration. In effect, what I'm saying by writing in 10 up here and putting a zero down here is that you are $10 better off for getting to emit that last ton. And you, f you would need to be compensated by $10 if we were to force you to not emit that last ton without leaving you any worse off. Now, that's the benefit to you. What about the cost to the victims of your emitting? that last ton. We've already touched on the fact that it has certain costs. The figure we want here is what's known as the social cost of carbon. And it turns out that this is quite controversial to calculate exactly what this figure is, but it is a figure that represents all of the costs due to potential flood, famine, uh, heat waves, uh, forced migration, We're trying to quantify all those complex costs and how they affect the totality of victims in the world. No one person suffers this cost. This is the aggregate. Now, as I say, it's controversial, but a figure that has some plausibility is $60. So I can represent it as negative $60, because as I said, this is a cost as opposed to the benefit we gain from emitting. And it's then you would correspondingly represent not emitting as, well, you don't suffer that cost, so it's zero. But note, it's just the relative values that the economist cares about. It's the difference between the two. So you could just as well represent it as it's worth nothing to the victims. You're emitting that last ton, but it is worth something to them. If you don't, it's worth positive $60. These two representations are equivalent. And because it's easier to work with positive figures, that's the way I'm going to represent it for our purposes. Okay, we now have enough of a framework in place that we can ask in a serious way, is there a possible Pareto improvement here? To identify this, it's helpful to indulge in a somewhat unrealistic thought experiment and imagine that we could get the emitter together with the victims in a room to negotiate. Now, as it happens, that's not going to be very easy in practice because the victims, of course, are billions of people and many of them don't exist yet. They live in, they, they're merely future people. But put aside that practical difficulty, if we could get them together, could they strike some sort of mutually agreeable bargain? Now, the victims might say, would you please forego emitting that last ton of carbon dioxide? Because, frankly, it's pretty costly for us. And the emitter, unfortunately, though, is liable to say, it might be costly for you to suffer my emissions, but it's costly for me to give up my emissions. So, no, I'm going to keep doing it. 
A better possibility though is the victims could recognise that in effect the emitter has a right to emit that tonne of carbon dioxide, which could be traded away. The victims could offer some money and say, would you forego your right to emit that tonne? Let's say they offered five dollars. Okay. What's the emitter going to say in response to that proposal? Well, they're unfortunately not going to be impressed. They're going to say, well, that would mean giving up a ten dollar benefit. I would gain five dollars cash. But the net effect of that is I'm going to go from a ten dollar benefit to a combined amount of benefits worth to me five dollars, and that's not a good deal. I'm not and accept it. I'd rather stick where I am. But there's no reason why the victims should stop at merely offering $5. Remember, to them, it's worth $60 to stop us emitting that last ton. So they might offer much more. They might offer 30 say. Now, the emitter would consider that's foregoing a $10 benefit, but gaining $30 of compensation. And as a package, that is better than simply emitting the last ton. That's an improvement. So the emitter would be very favorably disposed. What about for the victims? Well, they'll be going from zero dollars to obtaining a benefit of 60, though unfortunately they've had to pay out $30 to get it. But still, 60 minus 30 is a net effect of $30 benefit, and that's better than zero. So this is actually better for the victims as well. So this is actually the sort of agreement that both parties would be very willing to strike. It's an agreement that makes each of them better off. The emitter's position is improved and the victim's position is improved. What do we have then? Well, we have a Pareto improvement. A Pareto improvement is any time you improve the position of at least one party without making anyone worse off. Here we've in fact made both parties better off, and nobody is worse off. Now, you might think this argument's not very interesting if it can only explain the inefficiency of emitting the last ton of carbon dioxide. But you can simply reiterate the same argument. Having shown that it would be more efficient to not emit the last ton, you can ask, what about not emitting the second last ton? Is that How much benefit does the emitter get from that? How much benefit would the victims get from our not emitting that last ton? And could that be the subject of favourable trade? And by repeating this over and over, you might well find that the vast majority of our carbon emissions are inefficient. Exactly how far the argument goes is something that's got to be subject to further economic analysis, but it certainly is not an argument that's restricted to simply one ton. I'll pause this video here there's more to come though, because we have one big issue. How, in reality, can we achieve anything like a trade between these two parties, given that they do not exist at the same time?